Okay, that was an abrupt ending. But I think it speaks for itself. Uh, those of you who want to uh, join us in that, feel free to talk with Carrie and Stephen, and we'll get you all signed up. Okay, uh, we want to now shift gears a little bit. I think we need to dismiss the children to uh, Children's Church at this time. And uh, while the teachers and children are going, we, the rest of us can take out our Bibles, if you will. We're going to do a little mini review Bible study. <clears throat> and then I'm going to ask you to do some things this morning to participate with the Lord, uh, knowing that the Bible is very clear that we are not only co-resurrected with Jesus and are co-ruling with him, we are also co-building with him. So we have a responsibility as well to, um, to do some things to allow our future to be fruitful. Um, this particular month um, in the Jewish calendar, not our calendar, our calendar is August, but on the um, Saturday the 18th at sunset started a new month in the Jewish calendar. And that month went from Av to Elul, E-L-U-L. -L. Now that may not mean any significance to anybody in here. And depending on how you count that particular month, it can either be um, if you count the religious calendar from uh, Tishrei, it could be 12 months long. It could be the last month of the year. Or it can be the sixth month of the year, uh, depending on how uh, you, you count, uh, whether it's from Nisan, which Nisan 14, obviously, is Passover. And we know that the Lord said he was going to start his calendar on, on the Passover, and start the seven feasts there. But also we know that um, Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year. And we know that that month, particular month that the Lord, um, from an uh, agricultural point of view, started a new series of events in the life of Israel. So, so timing and months and things like that are very important to the Lord. They should be very important to us too. Things happen to us at specific times and seasons and appointments when we have appointments with the Lord in our lives. It doesn't happen every single day, but the Lord is with you every day, but he has certain days and certain times that he does things that are more profound than other days. It's called the Moed, or the Moedim of the Lord, the appointed times of the Lord. And we are in one of those appointed times because this particular month, Elul, which um, uh, Lyris started uh, speaking on last week, is a very important month in the life of the Lord because it has some things um, that we need to be aware of, of what it represents. Um, this year in particular, uh, God wants to encounter his people in a very unique and special way. As you all know, we are rocketing towards the end of an era and the end of a time, and that the return of Jesus is uh, ever more closer, obviously, in time, chronologically, but in spirit, you know, and you have a sensibility that something is cooking in the heavens that is um, ushering in the presence of the spirit of Elijah, which is very important, which leads to then the return of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I, I have to say that um, I knew what the Lord was, was kind of working with us in, in, you know, last week we did all the, the cards and everything. We wrote our disappointments and frustrations, etc., which were very important and everything. And I knew that the Lord wanted to destroy those things by fire today because of the month of Elul, which is a month that you actually start over. You get to do a do-over. It's the month uh, according to the Talmud and rabbinical teaching, <laughs> that the king is in the field. And uh, I think Lyris did a very good job of explaining that, but I'll just take it a step further. There, in the month of Elul, the, the, the kings of Israel, there's two kingdoms, obviously, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, but the kings of Israel would literally stay in their palaces and their there are places of residence, and you could not access them. If you were just like a regular person like you or me, you couldn't just go up and talk to King David. 
There were uh, certain protocols. There were a lot of people you had to go through to actually get to him ultimately, except for one month. In the month of Elul, which is this last 12th month, the king would go to the field, and he would set up a, a sukkah, or a tent, or a tabernacle, if you will, in the middle of the field, and every he would actually be there to pick the, the plums, um, mostly, uh, in those days, and in, in the, in the, in the harvest season, which would be this fall harvest, was very ripe, and the king would come out, he would go into this field, but every single person in the kingdom would have access to him without exception. And you didn't have to go through anything or anybody or anything. It was just literally the time of the year when you could face down the king face to face. And the king would, would be with his subjects and the subjects uh, literally would be with their king. I find it interesting that in the Song of Solomon, in uh, Song of Songs, it's uh, called, um, there is a scripture in uh, chapter 6, verse 3, that says, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. This is a very intimate saying, obviously, in the Bible. But in Hebrew, it's, Ani la dodi vi dodi li. And that is an acronym, and it, the acronym for it is, E-L-U-L. It is Elul. That is the acronym for, for that I am my beloved and he is mine in Hebrew. So what you get is a picture of I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. There's a time of great intimacy in the month of Elul that allows people to come into a place of dialogue with the king that is totally unique and different than any other single month. Also, in the Aramaic language, which is a, a language which is a derivative of classical Hebrew, Aramaic language, the word Elul actually means search. The definition of the word Elul means search. Now, you all know that there's a month coming up next month, which is a very powerful month. It starts literally, um, let's see here. It would start on the 17th. It's the month of Tishrei. And Tishrei is Rosh Hashanah. Tishrei 1 is Rosh Hashanah. We know Tishrei 10 then becomes Yom Kippur. And then Tishrei 15, following five days after that, is the great Feast of Tabernacles, which is the, the end time scenario of the Lord uh, working with the children. But you know that as you come into this season of Tishrei, it's all about repentance. Matter of fact, in the Feast of Trumpets, which is the first day of Rosh Hashanah on Tishrei 1, a great trumpet sound is blown across the land. And literally, it starts a period of 10 days till the time of Tishrei 10, which is the day of judgment, which is Yom Kippur, or the day of atonement, which is a better terminology. And that's the day when all the books are settled. Everything's atoned for. Everybody has, comes before the Bema seat and is judged in terms of whether or not their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. But what the 10 days between those two points are called is Yam Norarim, which is the days of awe, the days of teshuva, or the days of repentance or returning. So all of the people, all of the people of Israel will spend time during that period of time culminating the repentance and the change of heart that they have had for the Lord so that when it comes time for this incredible day of Yom Kippur, which, is a, which by the way, to the Jewish people, is the highest holy day that can be celebrated. That's the highest day in their calendar. And it has incredible spiritual significance for the church as well. But on that day, everybody wants to be right. Nobody wants to show up wearing blue jeans to the prom and standing before the Lord in a way that is um, not dressed properly, as Jesus put it. So this period of repentance um, in these 10 days is really the target. And then, of course, 
After that day, that incredible day of Yom Kippur, then five days later, which is the number of grace, starts the uh, Hagasukot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is the last and final feast of the seven feasts of Israel, by which and in which the Lord tabernacles with his people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the Lord makes his tabernacle among men, as the book of Revelations uh, so clearly teaches. So this is important to us to know that this word Elul also means search. So that in preparation for the days of awe, that the people of God would start <clears throat> preparing themselves and literally getting in alignment with the word of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord. And this is what's critical for us today, hearing what the Lord is saying and getting in alignment, getting ready for the days that are coming ahead. And this is the days when the Lord literally would give people fresh starts and new starts. Uh, like Lyris taught last week, do-overs, if you will. You get to have a do-over in the Lord in the month of Elul in a very unique and, and a very appointed way. Now, in this envelope here, it's, which is marked confidential, last week we asked everybody to come together and just, you know, just write down your disappointments, get your heart clear. We know what the Lord is, is wanting to do. He's wanting to take the lies that have been spoken to you either by yourself, which is the primary liar. The heart, among all things, is deceitful. People talk themselves into failure all the time, into bad attitudes all the time, into negativity all the time. And you can be your worst enemy, believe me. Your own mind can be your worst enemy. But then again, you have demonic uh, inferences. You have the lies of the enemy, which work through the human spirit as well telling you that you're a failure, that you've lost too much, and that all these things are just overwhelming. You'll never get out of the hole. And then, of course, you have other people, other people on the earth that may or may not, but sometimes will tell you something about yourself or treat you in a way that undermines the character of the Lord in you and the esteem and the value that you have in the Lord. Many people do not, especially Christians, do not recognize the fact that you are a royal priesthood and a holy nation and sons and daughters of the living God. And that you are people to be reckoned with. But, but mostly what we hear is that, you know, we're, we're dumb, we're fat, we're old, we're, we're never going to make it, we're failures, we got too many problems, you know, we got bad attitudes, we got all these negative things that the enemy likes to speak in place of what the Lord is actually saying to us. So there is a distance between what is really real in the Lord and what you've heard and what you've seen from mankind, from the enemy, and from yourself that is actually in opposition to what the Lord says about you and I. So the Lord says, I'll give you an opportunity to rewrite your book. Now everybody has a couple of books in your life. One is the Lamb's Book of Life, which we already know about what that is in the, in the book of Revelation. That's whether or not that your name is recorded as being engaged in and born again into the Lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ. He is the door. Thora is the word that, that no man can enter in any other way except through that particular door. It's Jesus. So no one will go to heaven except through the door, which is the door of the Messiahship of Jesus. So that's the Lamb's book of life. But the Bible clearly says, and other books were open too. Now, each one of us has a book. And what is written in this book is written uh, by multiple sources. Your book is written by those three entities I just discussed. The human spirit, the spirit of Antichrist or demonic spirits, or the voice 
of other people, which carries a lot of power as well. And whatever you believe gets written in this book. Whatever you believe about yourself gets written in this book. Whether that be positive or negative, whether it be something that is either true or not true, it doesn't make any difference. But whatever you believe is what actually transpires. And whatever you believe about yourself is actually what is recorded. So the Lord, in his incredible wisdom and his incredible grace and mercy towards us, allows those things to be written in pencil so that you can go back and erase things from the book. Now, the Lord is giving us in this month of Elul, this month of new beginnings and a month of exchanges, if you will, a month of being in the field with the king face to face. He's given us an opportunity to write some things down, which I, I was very happy for. And I, I kind of rehearsed in my spirit over the last couple of weeks of how to bring this to the point where the Lord would be satisfied with our, our uh, cooperation with him. Until I started reading these. And this is uh, full of those cards, by the way. I think absolutely everybody participated. And, of course, there's no names on them, so that there's, uh, there's no way to put the disappointment or the, even the sin uh, to connect to anybody. But I started reading them. And I started reading them way after I did all this preparation. And I started to weep inside to see how many people in this congregation has suffered so much personal loss and so much disappointment, not only with other people and not only with yourself, but also with God, being disappointed with God that he didn't show up on that day that you needed him. Or apparently... What it felt like is that he abandoned you in a desperate situation. And you had to ask, where are you, Lord? And why did you let this happen? And that wasn't just a couple of cards. It was like a, a, a majority of the, of the things that were written were written in the context of disappointment and loss and frustration with the, the place that we are in our life and in the Lord as well. And as I was reading this, I was looking at that and saying, Lord, wow, you have got to do something about this. You have got to do something. This is robbing the faith of the church. And unless we overcome that which has occurred to us in the past, we will never be able to enter into the future. And we all know the story of the cross and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ to obliterate sin and the power of sin. But, you know, the reality is, is that we are to put to death the old nature and the old man and the old thinking that goes along with that. But if you carry that along with you, if you as a Christian, a born-again Christian, keep pulling in the disappointments from the past and the things that happened to us in the past, what happens is you carry it into the future. And even though it's been paid for, and even though it is a redemptive act of the Lord to deal with the power of it, we still have the right to carry it in our pockets along the journey. And as we do that, we find out we begin to get cynical, we be, begin to operate in the spirit of unbelief. We start getting faithless instead of faithful. And we become more disappointed. And we carry that disappointment to the point of the word offense. And you say, well, you know, I don't have an offense against God, Pastor. What are you talking about? I want to tell you something. The spirit of offense is very insidious and very deceptive. You could be carrying it and half not know it. But just in the expression of your attitude, it's manifested that something happened 
that even though it has been redeemed by power, by blood, by death and crucifixion, the reality is that we, we didn't forget it. You know how the old saying is, how the Lord forgives and then he forgets. He throws your sins into the sea of his forgetfulness, indicating that when you have sinned and the Lord forgives you of a sin, and you say, oh, I, I repent, I'm sorry. And I say, okay, I repent. You are forgiven. Do you know that the Lord cannot remember that sin? That on the moment in space and time where he forgives that sin, he cannot recall it. What he does is he throws it into the sea of his forgetfulness, never to be taken back out again and never to be brought up again, because if he did, it would be the antithesis of what his son did on the cross, and he will not betray that. Therefore, he doesn't remember your sins. If he doesn't remember our sins, then the question must arise, why do we remember the offenses, the iniquities, the sins, the frustrations, and the disappointments? If he doesn't, and we do, well, what happens is that we drag them into our current life, and then it becomes a major, major problem. And as I was reading this, these, I was like, I'll tell you, I'm very rarely like that, where I cry on the inside. But it was so powerfully spiritual that, Lord, look what is at work in your people. The depth of disappointment. There's some people in this room who have suffered such losses. Losses of children. Losses of parents early, too early in their lives. And diseases and all kinds of things that have happened in your life. And, 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 you, and you wonder, where was the Lord in all of these things? And what has happened is the, the, the disappointments have grown into these little pockets of offense. And these pockets of offense reside in us. And what they do... It's the chief weapon of the enemy to keep us from being who we are in the Lord. Last week I spoke about the Athaliah spirit uh, the week prior to uh, when, when Lyris was speaking. And I said that the spirit of Athaliah was a spirit because of the nature of Athaliah. You know, Athaliah was the daughter of Jezebel by Ahab. So Jezebel was mom to Athaliah. And we know that the Jezebel spirit in and of itself is the spirit of witchcraft. And what is witchcraft? Intimidation, domination, control is the key word for witchcraft. Uh, and intimidation, which is what most Christians suffer, being intimidated either by other people or by the the, the circumstance or situation in your life seems too big and too intimidating, so you don't challenge it, you don't go forward. But these powers of witchcraft work through Jezebel. Jezebel has a daughter. Athaliah, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know this, Athaliah was the only woman in the entire history of the nation of Israel that ever sat on the throne of Israel as, as the ruler of Israel, the only one. Not Deborah, Deborah was a judge. Athaliah sat on the throne for seven years until Joash took over. And this is a phenomenal thing when you stop and think about it. All men always sat on the throne. King David, Jesse, Jesus, they're all only kings of Israel can sit on that throne, except for one woman, one time in history, sat on that throne for, they see, think, six to seven years until Joash took over as a, as a seven-year-old king. And during that period of time, Athaliah wanted to kill every single person that would ever be able to sit on the throne of Israel or Judah at that point in time. She was the 
the leader of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. And she sat on that throne. She, she tried to kill every single person. Every single child was literally put to death that was in the royal lineage of David to sit on that throne. Now, it was good that her uh, sister-in-law, without her knowledge, stole little Joash, actually kidnapped him and hid him away for six years and kept him alive. He was the only seed of the royal line of David that could actually sit on the throne. So what does the spirit of Athaliah really do? What does it want to do? It wants to kill the destiny of those who are supposed to sit on the throne, the royal priesthood. Now, I want to say to you, fast forward, the spirit of Jezebel works on Christians. You can be intimidated, you can be dominated, you can be controlled and manipulated by forces and powers and spirits that are not the Holy Spirit. And it happens to Christians all the time. That's why we pray deliverance over people, for the deliverance of the Jezebel spirit. So there's no batting of the eyes and this power of flirtation, this manipulation. That's a, that's a demonic spirit at work. In your life, you can be manipulated. You could be manipulated spiritually. You can be manipulated prophetically. I know, I, I've been in this a long time. I will tell you, I have heard prophetic guys manipulate people with prophecies. And you say, well, that's, that's the Lord. No, it's the spirit of Jezebel. It's the spirit of manipulation when it's not the Lord. Sometimes you can't put words in the mouth of the Lord. He, when he speaks, he speaks, and you know it. But when it manipulates people, then it's a whole different ball game. I have seen people manipulated out of finances, manipulated out of marriages, manipulated out of destinies by words that were sounding like the Lord, but in fact were not the Lord. So Jezebel works on Christians. Matter of fact, in the last book of the Bible, after all, after Jesus, after the resurrection, after the church, after the Holy Spirit, you find the Lord chastising one of the seven churches. It says, you tolerate Jezebel. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't remove her, and it wasn't a lady in the church, by the way. It's a spirit. He says, if you don't remove her, Jezebel, I'm going to put her on a sick bed, and I'll put everybody that is controlled and manipulated by her on the sick bed as well. That's a very strong statement by the spirit of the Lord to John in one of the last things ever written in the Bible. So you know that spirit is still alive. But in the same way that mom is still alive, the daughter is still alive as well. And the spirit of Athaliah is still alive. And in, in being a pastor and raising up men, I've ordained many, many people into the ministry. One of the things I find out is that one of the things the enemy loves to do is stop people from sitting in their rightful place, from fulfilling their destiny and fulfilling their purpose in the Lord. So if he can't kill you outright, and he can't stop you from following the Lord, he'll do the next best thing, which is stop you from actually fulfilling why you are on the earth and what you are called to do. And the spirit of Athaliah tries to kill that seed and it's still at work even into this day. So the people of God must rise up with not an Ahab spirit. Now let me just tell you something very quick for time's sake. Ahab was the husband of Jezebel. Now Ahab was the, was the king, but he was the classic abdicator. And by abdicating, what I mean is that when you have authority and you give it up or you drop it for the sake of somebody else, it creates a vacuum in the authority. And in the spirit, there's a, a void in the vacuum is always filled by something else. So if you have an Ahab spirit, 
which means you constantly allow for these things to happen. You don't fight against it. You keep yielding to this intimidation and to this pecking and gnawing, and you keep giving up, keep quitting. You create a vacuum, and that vacuum is filled up with another spirit. And in Ahab's case, it was his wife. She jumped right in there, and she became the one dictating what is going to go on in Israel. And literally started doing things that were actually in opposition to God. Well, in the same way, in the very same way, whenever we are being assaulted by either Athaliah or mom, Jezebel, this power of witchcraft, to the extent that we are in Ahab, to that same extent, the manifestation of those things will come to pass. So although Ahab was a king, an appointed king, in name and in title, the problem with him is that he didn't stand up and he didn't fight. And he allowed the manipulation, control, intimidation, domination to take over, and you know the rest of the story. But there's another character in this story. His name is Jehu. Jehu also was an anointed man of God, and he decided, we're not going to have this. We're going to stand up. And he is the one who called out Jezebel. And when he called Jezebel out, she was in the tower at that time, he told the eunuchs, there were a bunch of eunuchs. Eunuchs were desexualized males that were put around queens in those days so they would not violate the queen. There's no way possible that they could ever violate the, the queen. So they set eunuchs all around these important women in the Bible so they could not ever be molested or violated in any way. But they were also emasculated by the very same act of becoming a eunuch. So Jehu calls down from the tower. He's down on the, at the horse gate. He calls up to the tower and the eunuchs respond by throwing Jezebel off the top of the tower, and then Jehu's horse tramples her until only the head and the feet and the hands were left identifiable. Now, it's funny to me. I have prayed against, in, in, in deliverance, against the Jezebel spirit on hundreds of occasions. And one of the manifestations that you find in people is their hands start going like that, and their feet start twitching, and they have pains in their head. Now you may say, that's just a coincidence. But it's a funny thing. I can stand, be standing in a prayer line praying for somebody for the Jezebel spirit, watch their hands start going, and know it's the Jezebel spirit. And that's exactly how Jehu overcame her when he tramp, his horse trampled her into the ground. So there was a rising up. There was a Jehu spirit, and there was an Ahab spirit. But you know, that has never changed in history. As a matter of fact, all of us, to some measure and some extent, in almost every relationship that we have with other people, are either in a, Jezeb uh, a Jehu spirit, or we are in an Ahab spirit. We are either taking control, having authority, or having authority and control taken from us, which is why the Lord wants to say to us, in this season, I want this to change for you. Rather than being the brunt of all of this, he says, I want you to be on top of the horse instead of underneath it. And that whole term, being thrown under the horse, like we say it's being thrown under the bus, really is a derivative of what happened to Jezebel. We don't want to be thrown under the horse. We want to be on top of the horse, not underneath the horse. So the Lord intends to do some incredible things um, uh, with, his, with his people. Um, I'm going to kind of fast forward here a little bit. I just want to give you just really very quickly, and if you just listen to this, if you can't write it down, don't. You just get the tape later on. But I'm going to give you 10 indications 
of, of whether or not you're under the power of witchcraft in any way, shape, or form. This is the 10 manifestations. They are also in the order of how they occur. And this is after decades and decades of research and comparing notes with deliverance ministries. So number one, how you know this progressive sequence of witchcraft in operation in your life is number one, you start feelings of lethargy and tiredness. Just general old tiredness, like you're tired all the time, but you don't have a heart condition or a disease or anything. You just feel tired all the time, and you feel lethargic. This is beyond normal sleepiness and can often follow with disruptive sleep patterns. Uh, sometimes there can be physical nausea and some light difficulty in breathing. And there are a uh, hundred spiritual reasons for that I won't go into right now, but this is number one, feelings of tiredness and lethargy. Number two, discouragement. Discouragement. You start to feel discouraged. The removal, taking, or voluntary laying down of boldness or courage is the definition. And includes a sense of failure and unworthiness. You start feeling more of a failure, more unworthy. And then it leads to the third thing, which is doubt and unbelief. You start doubting not only the Lord, you start doubting yourself. The things, the very things you started out believing, now you're starting to question. Then the fourth thing is confusion and double-mindedness. All of a sudden, after this power starts working on you after a while, you start to get confused about stuff. You're confused about direction, about your future, about people, about what's right, what's wrong. Well, I think that's okay. Maybe, maybe homosexuality is not that bad. Maybe, you know, you get real confused about stuff. And you start becoming double-minded. You start agreeing with things that you would never normally agree with. Which leads to the fifth thing, after you get into this state of confusion. The fifth thing is accusation either received or expressed, you start blaming everybody and everything. Now, this works both ways. You can either be, be starting to be accused by people of things you've never even done. False accusation at work. You find you, you go in there and there's people are saying, well, you know, he, st he stole all the stuff off the desk. He didn't put the report in on time. And you find he's, you, you, you're being inundated with accusation. Or you become the accuser, which is part of the nature of the spirit, the accuser of the brethren. You start accusing people. Well, you know, it's, my, it's, it's the church. The church stinks. It's, it's the pastor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, it's my wife. She's really the, the problem here. No, it's my husband. No, it's my kids. No, you know what it is? It's my money. It's my finances. No, if it, I only had good health, you start accusing in an inordinate fashion. After the accusation, the next progressive level is the loss of vision and hope. You start to lose, after these five stages, the sixth stage, you start to lose your vision a little bit. What you started out with, you knew where you were going, you knew what you wanted to be, you knew you were gonna serve the Lord, you knew you were gonna follow, you knew you were called, you knew you had a purpose, all of a sudden, you lost the vision. You say, I don't, I, don't, you know, I don't know what's happening. I don't care what happens. I'm just living day to day. And of course, that leads to a loss of hope. Vision and hope, by the way, are always tied together. Which leads to the seventh thing. Indecisiveness and bad decision-making starts. When you're under the influence of the power of witchcraft, after a certain period of time, you begin to become indecisive. People will ask you, what do you want to do about this? And you will not give them an answer. Because you can't. 
You become, you don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong. You have no hope. You have no vision. You don't know what is good, what is bad for you. You don't know what the right course is or the wrong course is. You're caught in the valley of indecision. So you're indecisive. And the result of, of being indecisive, by the way, is that when you ultimately make a decision, it's usually a bad deci- decision. So bad decision making becomes a fruit of witchcraft, which leads to the next level. And then it starts to get serious right about here. The next level is called depression. Depression and oppression as well. Now, you can be oppressed without being depressed. But the reality is depression is more rampant in the church than we care to confess to. There are many, many Christians who are spirit-filled on their way to heaven to see the glory of the Lord that are completely depressed in the earth. And that's a power that comes over people. You can be oppressed by demonic spirits and the spirit of witchcraft even as well, which leads then to the next level, which is called abdication. Abdication is the Ahab spirit. Abdication is quitting. Abdication is giving up. Abdication is stepping off the throne that you're supposed to sit on. You know, when kings abdicate the throne, you hear this in history. You all went to high school, so you had high school history. And, you know, uh, the, the king of Norway abdicated his throne. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that he steps off the throne, says, I don't want the authority anymore. Give it to somebody else. Somebody else steps on the throne, and he loses all of that. So you get to a place, after you're so oppressed and depressed by life's attacking you through the spirit of witchcraft and manipulation and bad bad signals being sent your way, that you become depressed and oppressed. And it leads to abdication. Say, I quit. It's not going to work anyway, so why even try? And then it leads to the final thing and the most dangerous thing of all and the goal of Satan in the application of witchcraft which is isolation. Be careful when you start hearing a voice saying, I don't need my brothers and sisters. I don't need the church. I don't need to fellowship. I don't need to go to a prayer meeting. I don't need to share communion. I don't need to be in the context of koinonia. When you start hearing that, I'm telling you up front, it is the plot of the enemy. He knows that if he can withdraw you from the kingdom of God, which is the fellowship of the saints and the glory of the Lord in the church, in the earth, he's got you just where he wants you. If he can get you alone. You know, it's typical of every demonic spirit that I've ever seen on any level. When you're a bunch of guys together and somebody wants to kill somebody in that group, you know when you stand together, they don't don't come around. But what they try to do is they try to get one of the guys and pull him out. It's like a wolf does with a sheep. He tries to isolate the one sheep that is really on the fringe. And if he can isolate the one sheep, he can kill him. But you know, wolves never attack a whole herd, a whole flock of sheep. They never do. They're always going after the isolated one. Withdrawal from God and the people of God, isolation from the body of Christ can ultimately lead to rebellion against God, uh, the final product and goal of witchcraft. This is what the enemy wants to do. So he wants to drive these forces all away from feeling tired to complete isolation. Isolation is the worst thing that can happen to you in the body of Christ. Jesus was so adamant about two or more. He was so adamant about the concept of agreement. Whenever you are in symphona, the Greek word symphony, harmony with one another. When the whole miracle of the upper room, they were together in unity, in prayer. 
then this, these miracles happen. He is so adamant, he would not even send his ministers. This is Jesus covering these guys. Would not send his ministers out alone. The minimum was two, but never alone. Even Paul traveled with companions. Peter traveled with cohorts. And the enemy knows this story very well. He knows if he can get you at home, you shut the door, put the TV on, and get away from the, the power of the Holy Spirit in Koinonia. He's mostly got you where he wants you. And it's very manipulative. He will manipulate you out, out of the body of Christ. And you blame everybody. You know, they, you know, they hurt me in this church, so I don't want to go to any more churches anymore. Well, if you stop and think about the logic of that and the absurdity of it in the logic, it's like you throwing the baby out with the wash water. If something is dirty, throw the dirty part out, but don't throw the baby out with the dirty water. You know, it's just, it's just one of the things the enemy likes to do to make sure that you are depressed and that you're going backwards instead of forwards. So this morning, as the, um, the Holy Spirit brought to attention the game plan for what he wanted to do to start us over, I, in my reading of this, I saw so much loss, so much pain, especially about loved ones being lost and relationships being broken and destinies not fulfilled. And other areas, too, areas of finances, bad decision-making over the years, different things that have arisen in people's lives that you just are regretting. I regret I ever did that. It was a lot of what was on these documents. And I say to you, it is good that you have written those things down. Because in the writing of them, it's, it's just like confession, really. It's getting it out of the darkness and into the light. I believe with all my heart that the Lord wants to destroy by fire today that which the enemy has actually tried to do. And you get an opportunity to start over fresh and clean. And those of you at home can do this exercise at home as well. To put yourself in a position where you are rewriting your book and you are literally erasing some things that have been spoken and have been entered into the journal that shouldn't be there. Things about you that should not be in that book. It's not who you are. It's not where you're going. It is not your purpose. And to the extent and I believe the Lord really spoke this very clearly in the last two weeks over this Athaliah thing and last week in the re restoration of all things with Lyris. I really believe the Lord says, I'm going to give you another chance. In Elul, in the month of Elul, right, we're right in the middle of it. This is Elul 8 today. Elul 8 is today. And you know what 8 is? New beginnings. The number 8 stands for new beginnings. You're in the month of new beginnings. On the day of new beginnings, it just happens to fall that way today on August the 26th. So how coincidental is that? Well, the Lord knows what he's doing. And I really believe that if you take this seriously with the Lord, you say, Lord, this is really what I feel. This is really what I think. This is really my sensibility. This is what I resent. This is what I hate. This is why I was disappointed. When this thing happened and you did not answer immediately, I was disappointed. And I have carried that hurt forward. The Lord says, okay. Like he tells the prophets, when you hear, write it down. And as you write it down, what is happening is it's coming out of darkness. It's coming to the light. And I did a little research. I don't have time now because I only got three minutes left. I did a little re research on um, the um, fire in, in the Bible and why the Lord destroys everything by fire. How many of you know he's not going to destroy the earth by water anymore? 
That day is gone. Now everything is destroyed by fire. The earth, the whole earth is going to be in a consuming fire in the end of it all. The Lord's going to burn everything up. And then you look at the lake of fire in the book of Revelation, the book of Matthew, when Jesus was talking about it personally, how the enemy and all of his minions and all of his doctrines are one day, we'll, we will probably see this, you and I, over the precipice of eternity. We are going to see the, an angel of the Lord pick up Satan, Lucifer himself, pick him up and drop him in the lake of fire to be destroyed by fire. And then you're going to see all his minions, which is probably a third of the angels and all the other demonic converts, also go into this. And then all his doctrines, theories, thinking, strongholds, principalities, all are going to go in that lake of fire. Lord's going to destroy his entire kingdom by fire. And it dawned on me, that's right. The Lord destroys the satanic kingdom, thoughts, principalities, strongholds by fire. And that's when the Lord said to me the other week, he says, will not you take all this stuff? Just don't write it down. He says, I want you to burn it with fire. And when that smoke goes up into the air, from these words, which are true words, he says, you're going to see the prophetic fulfillment of the whole principle of starting over come into action and come into play. When Elijah confronted all of the prophets of Baal, all of the prophets of the queen that came together, there was 950 of them total. There was only one, one of him and his buddy. And they were standing by the altar and it was a major confrontation going on about the things of darkness versus the things of light. And the reality is, is that Elijah, you know the story, they, all the prophets of Baal stacked everything up. They put water on everything. And Elijah called down fire from heaven and destroyed all the offerings, all the product of these prophets of Baal, all of what they represented. But the Lord didn't even stop there. Elijah went on to kill 950 of the prophets of Baal as well. That's a pretty extraordinary story for one guy to be doing. But the principle behind it is, is that the Lord is not just a, a blanket murderer. He's trying to tell you something about what he feels about the product of these demonic forces. He wants them destroyed. And prophetically, we will destroy them by fire. So this morning, we want to um, take this a, a little step further. Um, we want to go, go back to these cards for a moment. And I'm going to hand these cards back out to the people that are in the congregation this morning. So, uh, Jesus, if you will... Uh, very quickly take these and just hand one or two to everybody in the congregation. Those of you who are at home this morning, um, I know some of you specifically, you can take your cards or your um, notebooks or whatever you're writing on, papers, and you can begin to take those out at this time. Um, we, we said last week that the second card for last week would be held for Teshuvah, for repentance, for Rosh Hashanah, etc. But I'm rescinding that because I felt like the Lord made a change in that. We want everything to be destroyed today. We're not going to hold anything over. Today is the, the month of preparation to getting yourself aligned. Teshuvah will be another thing. It will be another type of level that we will go into but today is clear in the Lord what he wants to do uh, number two um, we want to be able to break agreement with disappointments offenses weaknesses regrets addiction attitudes and motives on this particular day with this particular card 
I want you to write down this morning any lies that you know that were spoken over you and in you by any source. Ones that you hear in the back of your head. I'm fat, I'm old, I'm a failure. Whatever you hear. The ones that have been spoken by other people. And the ones that were spoken by demonic forces. So right now, you can start by, if you, by writing down any lies that were spoken over you or spoken into you by any, any other force other than the Holy Spirit. Secondarily, I want you to write down if you are a person that has been depressed or oppressed or you've been really wounded by disappointments, offenses. I want you to write down what the disappointment is and the offense. Some of you have already done that last week with your cards. You want to add to it this week? Good. Those of you at home, you can start clean and fresh. So we're going to break agreement with disappointments, offenses, any weaknesses that you see, spiritual, physical. Some people have wrote in the cards, I don't like the way I look. So that's the self-esteem issue. Weaknesses, regrets, any regrets that you might have had. You might be 70 years old, 75 years old, or whatever, and you said, look back and say, boy, I have a regret. Well, you don't want to carry that regret now anymore. You want a do-over. You want to wipe the power of that out. Addictions, attitudes, motives. Write that down. Thirdly, and most importantly, and you can hear this while you're still writing, any losses that you have suffered or lost dreams. Any losses that you have suffered or lost dreams. As you are completing that, what we have done this morning is I'm going to take these, which are a considerable number, which I was very surprised at, When we first did this, I didn't think anybody was really going to participate in that. And as you can see, there are an awful lot of people who have. We're going to do two things uh, this morning relative to the burning of this. I said we're going to have a bonfire, like Elijah calling down fire from heaven. So we're going to do that this morning. Um, I tried desperately to do this in the sanctuary, but according to my staff, the the, the smoke alarms and the which is one thing we could deal with. We, I, that didn't bother me that much, but the sprinkler system coming on bothered me a little bit more than that. So rather than have the sprinkler system come on in the sanctuary, what we have done. You notice there are two doors here. There's one here. There's one here as well. But on the other side of the wall is a fire pit that they have set up for us. So what we're going to do is when you are completed with your book, the things that you are erasing from your life's book, the things that are going to go up in smoke today, when you're done with all of that, we're going to take these, and some of these have been mailed to us from other places as well this morning. We're going to go out there. We're going to burn them in the Lord. And I want you to take yours personally. I want to take yours personally. Don't put it in this basket. I want you to carry it to the fire pit. I want you to put it in the fire as an act of your will, as an act of your volition. You take it to the fire. You put it in the fire you burn it before the Lord. And when it goes up, make sure it goes up totally in flame. Then you are done. And you can walk now with a clean slate. So if you have your card with you, I want you to hold it up in the air. I want to pray this prayer before we go out. This prayer. Just hold it up to the Lord as um, 
what has been written this morning in your book. Father, as we lift up, Lord, these acknowledgments of agreement, we are asking you today, O oh God, to break the power of the enemy in our lives from things that have been disappointing, things that have been lost, things that we have regrets about. Lord, we want to prepare ourselves to see you. And Lord, as we know that the enemy has, has really tried to manipulate us, to control us and intimidate us, and <clears throat> to cause us to be less than we actually are, this morning, Lord, we say, thus far and no more. We draw a line in the sand, O oh Lord. In our proclamation and declaration that says what is written today will be destroyed today. And we shall not resurrect it <clears throat> from the dead. We ask you, Lord, to take what is written into the sea of your forgetfulness. Never to bring it up again. Never to be influenced by it again. And never... To have it utilized against us by demonic forces ever again. So today, O oh Lord, we break free of that which was written against us. Those schemes of the enemy and those voices that led to depression and isolation, frustration. So today, O oh Lord, we do our part knowing that you will do yours. We submit to you, knowing that you have authority over all of the kingdom of darkness. And today, O oh Lord, let it be like the days of Elijah, when the fire of heaven comes, O oh Lord, and burns up every aspect of the enemy. You didn't even leave the water. You even burnt the water up. Everything must go. Lord, today. And Lord, what we write, we write in earnest. What we have, we come to you with a trueness in our heart, knowing, Lord, that you will not turn us away. And you will not be angry at our disappointment, even with you, for you are larger than we are, and you are more forgiving than we could ever be. So, Lord, before we burn these, we accept your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that you have so much grace that we can actually not understand how you can forgive us and forget everything we've done and said and everything we've felt. So today, O oh Lord, we bring this sacrifice to you, asking you, O oh God, God, to do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen. So what we'd like to do at this time, I'm going to ask Stephen uh, if you will come up and supervise uh, this. There are two doors here, um, and what we want to do is we only want to go out that door, and uh, we'll, we'll come back in this door here in a few minutes, but we all want to go out together um, before we ignite all of these particular cards. And then when these cards are ignited, these are the ones that we have already gone through through last week. I want you to take your card at some point in time as the Lord moves you and you're ready to do this. I want you to just go up and you just put your um, card into the, the, the sacrificial altar of fire before the Lord. Okay, and then when you're done with that, you're, you're clear and you can, uh, can go on. And uh, I just pray that you really see the result of this immediately, which I believe that the Lord would not put us through all this and then not show us immediate fruit from all of this in our lives. Okay, so Stephen, Brad, and Philip, if you guys want...